Good morning, everybody. I am so happy to be here with all of you in person after way too many virtual events and meetings. I'm sure you all feel the same way. I'm also extremely happy to be kicking off day two of Reinforce with, with this group and talking about identity. I'm here today with Bridget Johnson, who's going to join us later. She's the general manager of Access Analyzer. Uh, she's also an expert on access management. If you follow her on Twitter, you know all about her expert advice. And she's a rider of Pickles the Horse, whom you will meet, at least visually, during the presentation. Um, she's also an overall enthusiast for fine-grained access management, which I'm sure she'll, you'll appreciate as she joins me on stage. Let me give you a little sense of what to expect from the session today. Here's what we're hoping you'll take away. First, how is identity and access control central to achieving the security posture you want in the cloud? Then we're going to share the latest in identity capabilities that make it easier for you to centrally manage identities in AWS. And then Bridget will help us understand how can you refine your permissions using access analysis on your journey toward least privilege, which is always a best practice for permissions. So let's dig in. I'm sure you are all aware, at the foundation, AWS is designed to help customers build applications that are secure, resilient, performant, and efficient. Security is just fundamental to how we design and build our infrastructure and services. That's, that's job zero for us. And then we build security solutions to help you implement and maintain your optimal security posture on top of that infrastructure. Identity and access control is at the center of cloud security. I like to say that security starts with access control. If you went to the keynote yesterday, you heard CJ Moses, our CISO, give a really good example of this. He said, if you prevent your administrators from having access to critical, critical corporate data, guess what? You've automatically prevented any attacker from getting access to that data, even if they, on some unfortunate circumstance, happen to get access to your administrative credentials. So that sort of helps you understand that access controls and permissions address the prevent part of a cloud security model. But Identity integrates with several other services in AWS's security portfolio to enable a complete cloud security model from prevent all the way through to detect and remediate. For example, in AWS Security Hub, we surface findings from Access Analyzer. Um, you or other security professionals in your organization can thus get an overall view of security in Security Hub, including the identity aspects. And um, one of my favorite examples of this is an Amazon Detective. Uh, perhaps there's some anomalous event that you need to investigate to understand if it was a security incident. And Amazon Detective lets you investigate exactly who was taking what actions during that event because it traces the role session th through AWS to see what actions were taken through that session, even if additional roles were assumed. So you can see that we're looking at this holistically, how identity fits into the security of your environment and the, the security actions you need to take. So to make sure we're all grounded, what is an identity in AWS? You have many types of identities who need to do things in AWS. They're people, they're applications, they're AWS services that may be acting on your behalf. So I like to say that identities in AWS are people or applications that can make a request for an action or an operation on an AWS service or an AWS resource or an AWS application. We sometimes use the word principle to refer to any entity that authenticates in AWS and makes requests to take those actions. And this seems like a good moment to make sure that we start with the most important best practice for all of those identities. First and foremost, enable multi-factor authentication to strengthen the security for your credentials. As you've likely heard at Reinforce already, we're working to make it easier for you to, do, to apply MFA. For example, we've set up an ordering portal so you can participate in our free MFA token program. You can learn more about that at, on the show floor if you haven't already. Um, similarly, we recently extended support for MFA keys to the Safari browser if that's your browser of choice, and we're continuing to invest to make it easier to apply MFA and enforce it for your users. But while we're on MFA, just applying it is the first step. One of the places you're going to apply it is to your root credentials. All AWS accounts have root credentials. And once you've applied it, tuck those away. We do not recommend that you use those powerful root credentials for your daily tasks. So once you've secured them, make sure you have an IAM role that you can actually use for your job at hand. 
And I did say I am roll on purpose because I am rolls are really great for security. They offer, they provide short-term credentials, temporary credentials, so that you could, you, so that you have the protection of just them lasting as long as you've configured them, perhaps a couple hours. Um, in contrast, if you use long-term credentials, you have extra work to do. You have to secure them and rotate them, and so it's less effort to work with short-term credentials. To me, this is like the perfect combination of steps. Make sure MFA is in place, make sure you have your role set up, and take advantage of the temporary credentials that they provide. One of the things that I really enjoy about Reinforce is getting a chance to talk to customers. It's something that we do year-round, although here we get to actually meet you, all of you in, purpose, in, per in person. <laughs> Um, we hear from customers that you value several things about working with AWS Identity, and especially as you grow. Um, for example, one of the things you tell us is you actually have a growing number of identities. You may be hiring more employees, launching more applications, and so the fact that we provide support in our services as you scale and support for open standards that makes it easier for you to integrate those identities is something that really works well for you. And it's not just your identities that are growing, it's also your resources. Um, so you, val you tell us that you value the ability to group your resources in ways that let you logically reason about access to them. For example, you might define an application using Service Catalog App Registry. You might then define accounts, separate accounts that have a built-in security boundary for this, each stage of that, of that application as you build, test, and deploy it for operation and production. And you might even define more granular resource groups, perhaps a component of that application or a set of related resources in that application so that you can manage access just for that type of, app, that, just for that type of resource or group of resources. So that gives you your, a way to manage your identities as they grow and a way to manage your resources as they grow. As you add additional applications, a third thing we hear from customers is they appreciate the fact that you can organize your workloads into accounts and organize those accounts into a multi-account hierarchy using our AWS organization service. That once you've organized everything that way, you get the benefit of the individual workloads, but you also get the ability to centrally manage the governance rules you have for your organization and the management functions like billing. But at the center of all of this is the key. It's the fine-grained access control that connects the identities to the resources under the conditions where you think you should grant access so that the right identities have access to the right stuff in the right situations. You have a lot of feedback for us, too. We get many requests from customers, and we always use those to inform our roadmap. If you have more requests, I would, I'd really love to hear more of those today. The first thing we hear is that we should continue to make security, availability, and scalability our top priority, and that is our intent. It is always our top priority. You probably know that IAM um, operates at truly remarkable scale. It handles more than half a billion requests per second, and that's just keep heading north as all of your businesses grow. Um, we ensure the security of AWS, and then we provide the capabilities to you that enable you to configure secure access on top of that. The other thing we hear from you is that you really appreciate how fine-grained our access control is because you can fine-tune it down to the exact permissions you want to grant, but you would appreciate more prescriptive guidance about how to get from here to there and a better understanding of how can you apply best practices to your particular use case. And a key theme that I've heard recently, especially increasing as, as AWS capabilities expand, is please streamline the experience. Please bring this stuff together to make it easier for all the different people and different types of jobs who use identity to get their tasks done. Um, there are administrators who need to configure things. There are developers who are just trying to get their new prototypes to work. There are security professionals who are trying to verify everything still works as intended. All these people have work to do, and you'd like to see a more seamless experience and an easier mental model about which capability to use in which situation. With that in mind, I think you can see it's, it's all connected. What you need to actually accomplish your identity and access management goals is a way to you know, scalably manage the identities. You need the governance framework under which those identities can operate. You need the permissions that define what those identities can access and the access analysis capabilities that, mat that let you verify that the access matches your intent. And once you've got this whole picture together, hopefully it comes up into that balance bridge you can see here on the screen. 
And this combination is why I'm super excited that we've announced IAM Identity Center. It's the successor to AWS Single Sign-On, or AWS SSO. Um, on the service, this is just a new name for a service that hopefully many of you are already using. And if you are already using the service, it works exactly as it did earlier this week under its new name today, with the same user experience and the same APIs you've been calling. But if on the surface it's a new name, below the surface, for me, it's a new way of thinking, especially about that seamless experience I was just talking about that you've asked for us to provide. It brings together our identity capabilities and our access capabilities for workforce users under one umbrella. And I think there's several benefits of doing that. One is, is it really helps emphasize that IAM Identity Center is built on the foundation of IAM. It effectively orchestrates the IAM configuration you may already have begun using in particular accounts across all those accounts and applications you use in AWS. The second reason I think it's a good idea is Identity Center better conveys all the capabilities that we're building into Identity Center than single sign-on did. That's just one of many things it can do for you, especially if you think about the fact that it can integrate with the identity provider you have, synchronize your identities, and help you manage them over their life cycle. I'll talk more about its capabilities next. And the final reason I think this is really a good idea is Identity Center is our recommended front door for access for people into AWS. But you may have other use cases as well. Bringing together all of our identity access management capabilities under the same umbrella will make it easier for you to discover the best approach for your particular use case. And it also makes, you, it, makes it easier for you to figure out how should I add support for additional use cases as they arise. So I'm very excited to see how customers begin to use this product and, at, and for you to continue to explore it as we make it more and more powerful. Our approach with IAM Identity Center is to centralize identities for everything you do on AWS, whether that's accessing your accounts, accessing your applications, or both. We want to make it easier for your administrators to configure and manage identities once, and easier for your end users to have a consistent experience for everything they want to do. What you tell us is that you have two main use cases. You have the need to access the resources and accounts. This is sometimes more common to see for the developers in your teams who are actually trying to get in there and configure EC2 instances or containers. But you also have end users who need to access higher level applications. For example, you might have data analysts who need to use SageMaker Studio for their latest machine learning project. Um, those two use cases are really quite unique. You may have one, you may have the other, or you may actually have both in your organization. For this reason, IAM Identity Center it, it is built to address both use cases, either together or separately. It's our recommended approach to centralize your workforce identity and access management. And it includes three key capabilities. It gives you that central location to create new identities in AWS or to connect to the existing ones you already have and from there use those across AWS. It gives you the ability to grant access centrally to integrated AWS applications and to any SAML 2.0 compliant applications that you may use from, uh, from SaaS providers or that you might even build yourselves. And it gives you a central plate management of permissions to all the AWS resources in each of your AWS accounts in a multi-account environment. So let's look a little closer at these. Let's start with the identities themselves. We have a unique philosophy here. Our philosophy is to provide flexibility so you can use the identity source you have or create identities directly in AWS. If you're using a standards-based identity provider, IAM Identity Center integrates with it and complements it for more streamlined workforce access into AWS. Your users sign in using the same corporate credentials that they sign in to do everything else they do during their workday, and they use the same process they always use to do that, nothing unique, and you can synchronize the attributes of the identities into AWS to use in your fine-grained access control. As one customer told me, he said, I'm happy with the identity provider I use, which they purchased from an AWS partner, but what I want is a front door into AWS, and that is exactly what IAM Identity Center provides. We partner with providers, including several who are supporting our IAM Identity Center launch here at Reinforce, Okta, Ping, OneLogin, ForgeRock, many others. Um, and we also integrate with Microsoft, where we support both Azure Active Directory as an identity source, 
as well as Active Directory, you may be running on premises, the, the latter that we do through our high fidelity managed Active Directory service, which can also help you migrate and modernize applications for the cloud. Next, application access. IAM Identity Center integrates with a bunch of AWS applications. I mentioned SageMaker Studio. If you're an operator, Systems Manager Change Manager may be one you need to use. IoT SiteWise is a third, third example. Those integrations make it easy for you to expose the users to the capabilities they need. And some of those applications even have built-in identity capabilities so you can configure identities right there in the app as you're working. Um, IAM Identity Center also provides pre-configured settings for many cloud applications, including Salesforce, Box, and Microsoft 365, if you choose to configure those, and a configuration wizard so that you can set up any custom SAML-based application. A core use case for IAM Identity Center, though, is multi-account access into AWS, and so I want to focus a little bit more on this one. The great thing about how it does this is there's no individual setup in each, in, in each of the individual accounts. That's what, you, that's what you might have to have done in the past if you used IAM directly. You had all this power at your fingertips, but you had to set it up one at a time. IAM Identity Center sits on top of that and lets you orchestrate the multi-account access centrally. You can assign user permissions across those accounts to meet your requirements and configure permissions in a bunch of flexible ways. You can pick from our pre-configured policies, such as ones that are tied to particular job functions, like our network administrator policy that's pre-configured for the permission someone in that job needs. You can assign permissions based on attributes. For example, if you have uh, attributes in your corporate directory that help define what people should or shouldn't be able to do, you can synchronize those attributes into AWS and then use them in your permissions. Imagine you have, for example, a cost center where you're doing a special project. You might synchronize the cost center of your employees into AWS and then write your permissions in a way that only users who have a cost center that matches the tag on a particular resource should be able to access that resource. A third thing that you can now do is write custom permissions and make sure that you can import them into IAM Identity Center, which I'll talk a little bit more about. We've really been listening to your feedback and adding the features that you've told us are most important to make this process scalable and easy for you to manage the workforce identity uh, needs you have with IAM Identity Center. Right in time for Reinforce, we added this capability I just mentioned customer managed policy support in IAM Identity Center. A customer managed policy is just a policy that you fine tuned and customized yourself. And we, what a lot of customers told us is, I, I've spent time on that. You know, I've made sure that I reviewed my permissions, uh, you know, to fine tune them to make them more least privileged, and I want to be able to put the policies I've refined to work um, in the, all the places that they make sense. Uh, so you can now import that kind of policy into IAM Identity Center, where you can then assign it to specific users and groups. Of course, the same thing applies if you need to create a new policy, perhaps using some of the tools Bridget is going to talk about, such as our policy generator. Th you know, th that you can also import. Um, one customer told me uh, earlier this week at Reinforce that his team got started on this right away. They were so excited that they were able to reuse their policies that they knew this would make it easier for them to scale and assign permissions, the, the right permissions to the right users. So if you haven't checked it out, I hope you will start doing so. I want to mention one more feature that we launched recently that helps you achieve your security posture. First, let me start with a little bit of background. When you use AWS organizations, you structure your organization with a management account and dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of member accounts that contain your workloads and the shared services that you use in your, in your organization. Because the management account is extra powerful, the best practice is just don't use it. Don't do a lot of work there. Don't provide a lot of access to it. And one way we help customers achieve this best practice is we let you delegate the management of particular AWS services to one of your member accounts. A long-standing example of this is that you can delegate the administration of guard duty, our threat detection service, to a designated security account in your member account in your organization. And then that designated security account can manage guard duty across all the member accounts in your organization. And now you can do the exact same thing with IAM Identity Center. You can delegate administration to a designated account 
which can then assign users and groups access to all the other member accounts in the organization and thus reduce the actions you're taking in your management account, helping you achieve that best practice. So we've been talking a lot about how IAM Identity Center is the best practice for managing access to people, for people who need to get into AWS. But before we totally wrap up this identity section, I want to talk about a different use case. I want to talk about access for applications. You may have heard a little bit about this in the keynote yesterday, and you can go real deep in it if you'd like later today in the session IAM 205. But we, a few weeks ago, we launched IAM Roles Anywhere. This extends IAM roles, so you can use them in workloads running outside of AWS. That lets you tap into all the power of AWS services wherever your applications are running. It lets you manage access to AWS services in the exact same way you are doing today for applications that run in AWS, for applications that run on-premises, at the edge, really anywhere. That means less testing effort for your teams because you're configuring access the same way. It means a more consistent deployment process. And yes, it means a more secure environment. Here's why. It's more secure because using an IAM role is that short-term credential I talked about earlier. That's less effort to secure because you're no longer having to manage the rotation and the security of any long-term credential that you might have used for on-premises applications in the past. This capability, I'm super excited about it because it aligns with how at AWS we're really trying to deliver a consistent AWS experience wherever you need it from the cloud to on-premises, at the edge. I think the potential of this new feature is really high, and I can't wait to see how all of you use it. I want to talk a tiny bit more about how it works. It lets you obtain short-term credentials from different types of environments, maybe servers, containers, applications outside of AWS. It uses X509 digital certificates to secure those requests using a managed certificate authority that you might have in AWS, or perhaps a cert certificate authority that you operate yourself. Because you're going to use those certificates to secure the access, it's the exact same IAM roles you're used to with the exact same IAM policies you're used to, um, but you still have the ability to make it very fine-grained. You can reference conditions in your IAM policies about when the access should apply, even using aspects of the certificate itself, like the certificate subject. A good example, if you're trying to figure out, like, what would I use this for, is imagine you have an application running on-premises, and you're not quite ready to migrate it to the cloud for whatever reason, but you know you have an immediate cost savings opportunity if you can stick its logs in S3. You can configure IAM roles anywhere so that on-prem application can put its logs in S3 securely using temporary credentials, just like you do for your other applications that are doing the exact same thing but out running on AWS. I hope you'll check it out and you can learn more in the deep dive session. Now that we've talked about identities, I want to invite Bridget up to talk about streamlining access management, which hopefully she will do. Don't worry. <laughs> Here you go. Have fun. Thank you. Thanks, Karen, for sharing all of those wonderful identity updates. My favorite happened to be about customer managed policies. You all know that I love policies and access management. So we are going to dive into streamlining access management for agility. And why do you want to think about this? Because you want to do the right thing for your business, for your business requirements but you want your engineer to also be able to innovate and build and have agility to build things for your business. Just to recap, when we talk about access management and access in AWS, there's two parts to it. The first part is your job. Everyone sitting in this audience, you specify who has access to what. And you can specify governance controls across your accounts and organizations to restrict and set your business up for success or you can specify fine-grained controls, and probably a combination of both, if we're being honest, uh, to really get into who can access what for that specific Lambda function, for that specific task that you're running. And once you've specified, AWS has the job of enforcing. And when we think about enforcing, every single request that comes into AWS, we look at your policies, we look at the request, and we give a yes or no answer allowed or denied access. That's a lot of requests, and that's a lot of enforcing of permissions. 
Our job is also to help you specify those access controls and make it easier so you know that you got the right permissions. If you have walked the halls of Reinforce the last few days, you've probably heard the term least privilege. It's something when we talk about permissions, we love to talk about. And it's about granting users and systems uh, a set of privileges to complete the required task. But there's a balance here, and I want to talk about that term required task, because that is going, your requirements are going to be different based on your different use cases. In development, you might want to have developers build and play a little bit and explore, right? When we're building out new systems, they want to try new things. However, when you get to production, those permissions better be locked down pretty tight. And so there's a balance, um, and you can work towards it. Getting to least privilege is a journey, and that's what we're here to talk about today. And one way to start when you think about access management and your strategy for your business is you want to think about your account strategy. And an account is a resource container, a security boundary, cost tracking and billing, and it helps you enforce limits and thresholds. You want to use multiple accounts. Let your teams have counts, maybe it's separate regions, maybe it's separate environments, development, production, different uh, projects. Think about how you're going to use multi-account to set your organization up for success. But because you have multiple accounts, you're going to want to use organizations. Organizations helps you manage multiple accounts. You can group them together. You can put them um, uh, into different uh, groups that allow you to govern across them. I do want to th point out that with organizations, there are dozens of integrations, so you can govern across your whole environment. You can turn on CloudTrail, GuardDuty, AWS Config, and lots of other integrations with more on the way. If you haven't checked out the latest list, um, I recommend you go back and, and look at what is there today. But the other thing with organizations you want to think about, and this is something that as you evolve in your AWS journey and you become more mature and you add more accounts, you want to think about how are you grouping them together. And I highly recommend this white paper, which is organizing your AWS environment using multiple accounts. It talks about strategies. And it might be a little different than you expect. Some customers think we should do it based on business unit. But it's really about the governing controls that you want to establish across your organization. And as Karen mentioned, Customers and you all in the audience, you are looking for prescriptive guidance. And so when it comes to establishing those governing controls across your organizations to set your engineering teams up for success so they do the right thing and it's easy for them to do the right thing, you can look towards AWS Control Tower. With Control Tower, you can quickly set up and configure a new environment. You can automate ongoing policy management. And you can uh, view policy level summaries. Check it out. It definitely helps you get on the right path with some prescriptive guidance from AWS. And one I want to double click on is data residency controls. You all know the world we live in. And where your data is stored, where your data is processed, matters. And you want to make sure you have the right controls and governance controls to set your teams up for success. So they operate in the right places, and they have the data in the right place. So with Control Tower, you can specify the region or regions that you want to operate in and choose from over 17 new guardrails purpose-built for granular control. And with Control Tower, you can see the compliance of those guardrails across your environment. All right, another coarse grain control when we think about governing access for your entire AWS environment is establishing a data perimeter. And this is where we've been investing a lot of resources into helping you get to the right data perimeter for your business. When we think about a data perimeter, you think about things that belong to me and things that don't belong to me. And that is what you want to put that perimeter around, that green box that we see here on the left. So what is a data perimeter? How do we describe it? A data perimeter is your trusted identities are accessing your trusted resources from your expected networks. It is three parts. Identities 
Karen just talked a lot about identities. Those are the principles, the roles, the users in your accounts or AWS services acting on your behalf. The resources are your resources in your account or the resources that AWS is managing on your behalf. And expected networks are your on-premises or your uh, virtual private clouds. And you want to make sure that's all included in your data perimeter. And that will also set your teams up for success, because that means your data is staying in your perimeter. Your stuff is your stuff. There are workshops. There are blog posts. There's documentation on data perimeters. We've made a lot of headway, because we provided the controls. And now we help you put those controls together to establish that perimeter. So go check it out. OK. So now you've set up success by having governing controls, your data perimeters, data residency controls. And that establishes those guardrails, kind of like those bumpers when you talk about access management. But here's the fun part, right? This is when you get to go into the fine grained within those accounts. And you get to specify who can access what. You can specify which principles can access which services, which actions, on which resources, and under which conditions. You can get very, very fine-grained in permissions with AWS. And it is very powerful and tons of fun. Speaking of conditions, it's one of my favorite ways to control access. You think about, I can grant access, but only if. So you can write policies that say, you can create a Lambda function, but only if you're using CloudFormation. That way, all of your code is stored in there. It's code reviewed. It's deployed um, as infrastructure as code. You can say, only allow these certain actions, but only if they're by an AWS service. Right? That means the, your developers have to use the AWS service uh, to, to deploy infrastructure or to, to get a project up and running. Or you can say, only allow writing data but only if the resource is in my organization. That goes back to the data perimeter that we talked about. We are constantly adding new condition keys. You'll see service-specific condition keys. You'll see AWS-wide condition keys. And these are to help you get to the right access. But how do you get to the right access? It does not happen overnight. Why doesn't it happen overnight or in an hour? Well, because you don't know what you need when you get started. And so it is an evolution. It is a process. It is a journey. And I like to think of the permission life cycle to get to the right permissions. You set permissions, you verify they match your intent, and you refine what you don't need. And it continues as you grow, as you mature. So let's talk about setting permissions. And here we have Pickles, who's my horse. And he is on a journey. This year, we took him to the beach, so he was on a journey to learn how to walk on the beach, a little scary at first, but he got it. And speaking of that journey, when you're at AWS, you might start with broader permissions. And you can use AWS Manage Policy to get started, or a lot of customers use custom templates that they say, these are the approved services you can use. And that's when you're exploring AWS. But you don't want to stay there. You want to keep moving forward, and you want to work towards right-sizing your permissions. If you have workloads or specific tasks, you want to get to that fine-grained permission where you specify specific actions and resources. And that's where you can use policy generation with IAM Access Analyzer to help you along that path. With policy generation, we look at what you performed and generate a policy for you. All right. So maybe that's not good enough. You really want to get super fine-grained and use those conditions I talked about. Well, there's a DIY model, do it yourself. And you can author custom policies, but we still have your back. We provide policy validation with Access Analyzer, and there's a over 100 checks to make sure you have secure and functional policies. All right, policy generation. This was a feature we launched in 2021. So if you haven't checked it out, I highly recommend it. But here's how it works. You run your application or your task. In my organization, our engineers actually ran a run book um, to, to take an action uh, to perform a task. And then they went to Access Analyzer. They said, hey, Access Analyzer, can you, can you create me a policy, please? And uh, they didn't actually have to say please in the command line. That was just a nice thing to add. Anyway, Access Analyzer gets to work. It goes, looks at your cloud trail, sees what you need, and then gives you a policy, and you can customize further. 
When I'm talking about you here, I'm actually talking about the development teams. I've talked to customers and somebody said, asked me, Bridget, who sets the permissions? And what we're seeing more and more is that the central security teams will establish those governing controls, the ones I talked about earlier, will establish the data perimeter, will establish the regions, but developers can set the permissions for their applications, for their runbook, for the fine-grained rules that they use. Um, and because they know what it is. And this is a tool, policy generation, that can help them along the way. And we are continuing to invest in tools that help engineering teams, that help developers get to the right fine-grained permissions for their applications and for tasks that they need to run. And we also have policy validation. And so these are going to be for your existing policies or if you're authoring a new policy. If you're authoring a new policy and you're doing it in the console, Policy validation will run right then and there. If you have existing policies, you can use it programmatically and run it on your existing policies. We've seen customers start to implement this in their CI CD pipelines. So what is policy validation? Well, we validate your policies and we look for things. We have over 100 checks. Each check has a name and actionable guidance actual guidance that points to a documentation page. So we really help guide you along best practices here. What we're seeing, well, there's four types. There's a security finding, there's an error, general warnings, and suggestions. What we're seeing is a lot of customers double click on those security, which is gonna be overly permissive access. They also are looking at errors. Some of them are gonna be invalid actions, some of them are gonna be a missing comma, it just depends on where you're at in your policy. And then the general warnings and suggestions kind of just guide you along. All right, so you've set your permissions. All right, now you've got to verify them. What do you want to verify? First and foremost, you're going to want to verify that public and cross-account access, because that is everything that goes beyond that perimeter that we just talked about and you want to make sure that that's right, that those permissions on your resources are only granting public access if it's intended or cross-account access if it's intended. And you can use Access Analyzer to generate findings for you based on those configurations. You're also going to want to look at pass role access. So this is the ability to take a role and pass it into another service or to a Lambda function or to an EC2 instance and most likely your account has an admin role in it. So you don't want overly broad pass role permissions. You want very specific pass role permissions. And we have a pass role check in policy validation. You can run that on all your policies today and see where you stand. You also want to inspect powerful permissions. These are maybe, ooh, we don't want everybody to be modifying network controls or everybody to be modifying bucket policies. Depends what you deem powerful. And you can go and look at who has the access and then um, if they actually used it. And if they haven't used it, I'd highly recommend that you remove it. Speaking of Access Analyzer, we look out for you, just like Pickles is looking out for probably food, if we're being honest. But uh, with Access Analyzer, you enable Access Analyzer in your organization or your account. It's free. It continuously monitors and reviews your permissions on your resources. We have seven resources today and we are continually adding more. We look at all of the configuration for those resources from a permission standpoint, and we use automated reasoning to determine if there's public or cross-account access. If we see public or cross-account access, we generate a finding. And this is where you step in and you verify. You can say, hey, Access Analyzer, that's expected. I want that cross-account access to my trusted partner. Or you can say, whoops that is not expected, and you can go update the policy to remediate it. I dropped in automated reasoning, and you've probably heard that term a lot at, here at Reinforce. Um, it is how we are innovating in the security space, both to help you with your security configurations, but also the security of our own system. So what is automated reasoning? The way I like to explain it and how I explained it to my parents was we encode AWS into math. And once it's math, you can ask it questions and you can generate proofs based on that. And I, I, I think it was in high school, uh, I did the, you know, the, the proofs and then you finally get a therefore. 
And once you get a therefore, you can make a universal statement. So if we think of reasoning as applying logic to a new conclusion, then automated reasoning is to reason about an infinite number of paths. And then you can make universal statements like, is this public? And if it is public, then Access Analyzer will generate a finding for you, and you can verify that external access. OK. So you've got your governance controls. You've got your data perimeter. You have. You set your permissions. You verified them. But now you need to refine them further. So what do you want to look out for? First rule is essentially get rid of what you don't use. Right? You probably have roles lying around. You probably have IAM users lying around that you haven't used. You can use role last uh, used and access key last used to, to see the last time you used it. If you want to double click into a specific role, you can use unused permissions, service, and action last access. Or, and uh, I recently talked to a customer who didn't know we had this feature, so I want to make sure I, I call it out, is that if you are trying to establish those governance controls, you can see the last access information across your accounts, your OUs, and your organization. So you can go in and see that you didn't use a specific service. And if you're not using it, you don't plan on using it, you can just restrict it so you never have to worry about it. When we think about uh, cleaning up things that we haven't used, that reduces the risk. Right, that helps you have a better security posture. And across the board, we are providing last access information to help you make informed decisions so you can clear out what is no longer needed. All right, I talked a lot about permissions, which is wonderful. And I said a lot of shoulds, like think about your account strategy, set up guardrails, get to fine-grained access, use the tools in Access Analyzer to help you do that. But they are all written down. So you don't have to take a bunch of pictures of slides. You can go to the IM best practices. We recently revamped them. There are 14 of them. And if you look at it, spans across identity and access, and we'll continue to add more. Uh, we talk about short-term credentials, something Karen mentioned. We talked about uh, your root user credentials and applying MFA. We talked about least privilege. And then the tools to help you get there, policy generation, policy validation and using conditions along the way. So check those out. There's more information on the documentation page with links to helpful how-tos. Here are some additional uh, resources that you can use, um, something, some things that I talked about. And I would like to say thank you. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for thinking about your identity and access management strategy to help your teams build and innovate on AWS while setting them up for success. Yay.